Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man who just keeps trying to get a little better, a little better than before. He is the captain. And it's not working. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. This week, we are very excited to be slow sipping on a delicious IPA from the good folks over at Boulevard Brewing Company. This one is called Space Camper Cosmic IPA. This is a massively hoppy IPA with some bitterness up front and juicy tropical fruit flavors that include both nectars and citrus. Garage grade four and a half bottle caps out of five. All right. Yeah. B W E W R U N beer run. If you need more True Crime Garage for your earballs, check out our bonus show called Off the Record. You can do so at truecrimegarage.com. And that is enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. Sunday night, May 24th, 2009, Monroe County, Michigan. Authorities issued an Amber Alert for five-year-old Nevaeh Buchanan that night. The alert indicated that she was last seen at the Charlotte Arms apartment complex in the parking lot area around 6.30 p.m. She was three feet, ten inches tall and about 45 pounds, was wearing a light blue sleeveless shirt, with red and white horizontal stripes and a white v-neck collar and knee-length jeans. She was barefoot when she left her mother's apartment. Police swarmed the large apartment complex and started talking to the residents. Search parties comprising of 100 law enforcement personnel and 500 volunteers fanned out from the complex and checked everywhere they could think of. Helicopters scanned the area from overhead divers plumbed the depths of local quarries. Her mother, Jennifer, said she spent all day and all night looking everywhere for her little girl. People searched frantically for days to no avail. Within five days, it was reported that the local sheriff's department had talked to 250 people. The Michigan State Police and FBI helped out, making up a task force with the local police. All the tactics and strategies for locating someone were deployed, but Nevaeh was gone. This is True Crime Garage. Five-year-old Nevaeh Buchanan loved her scooter. And neighbors were accustomed to seeing the little girl zipping around in their Charlotte Arms apartment complex parking lot. The apartment complex is located on North Malcolm Street in Monroe, Michigan. It was May 24, 2009. This is the day before Memorial Day. It's a sunny day and a great time for children to be outside playing with friends. Nevea and other kids from the complex like to cut through a hole in the fence and play at a playground that abutted to the complex's grounds. Sometimes they stuck to the parking lot. Some kids saw Nevaeh here that day, on her scooter, speeding around. And then she was gone. Nevaeh's mother, Jennifer, was used to her daughter running around the complex with the other kids. It's unclear whether Nevaeh had rules in place about being allowed to go outside on her own. After all, she was only five years old. Jennifer was home, sitting on the couch in their apartment, around 6.30 p.m., watching the TV show John and Kate Plus 8. Nevaeh was bored and tells her mom, 
Mom, I'm going upstairs to Austin's. Austin was an eight-year-old boy that lived in the apartment one floor up from Nevea and Jennifer. Nevea and Austin were buddies, and his apartment was somewhere where she hung out regularly. We will go through the events as they have been reported that led up to the disappearance of Nevea, but it is important to note that at the time, five-year-old Nevea, her mother Jennifer, are living with Jennifer's mother Sherry. The apartment is technically the grandmother's apartment, so Sherry's apartment. And on this Memorial Day weekend, Jennifer had a friend of hers and the friend's little daughter staying with them in the apartment as well. So it's a little cramped. Nevaeh's mother says around the 6.30 time period, she comes in to change her clothes. Yeah, she changes her clothes. She grabs a popsicle. And then Jennifer says that Nevaeh went back outside. Jennifer would later say that she assumed that her daughter went to eight-year-old Austin's apartment unit to play there. She assumed the two friends were playing with toys or watching TV. Now, Jennifer says that about 30 minutes later or so, Jennifer's friend's daughter, which is a little girl as well, she came into the apartment, said, Nevaeh is riding her scooter in the road. You know, one little kid tattling on another little kid. Jennifer spent some time looking for her shoes because she wanted to go outside and confront her daughter and let her know you can't be riding your scooter in the road. Right. So she spent some time looking for her shoes. We don't know exactly how much time. And this is kind of key because this is something we will circle back to around in a little bit. But she makes her way outside and she's looking in all the normal spots and cannot find her daughter. Jennifer checked at other units in the apartment complex as well, where she knew that Nevaeh had some friends, this including the little boy Austin's apartment. She could not locate her daughter. Well, and at this point, you're looking around this complex. You know where she plays. You can't find her. Obviously, some panic is going to start setting in with her mother. So she calls the apartment manager to help her look for her daughter. And Jennifer does a lap around the building and around the other side. And this is where she finds a big major red flag here. Because leaning up against the back of the building, Jennifer found her daughter's purple and green scooter abandoned. It seems that Jennifer may have underestimated how long Nevaeh was gone. We have to note here that she told many people this included reporters, and this included true crime TV personality Nancy Grace, that it was only about 30 minutes that her little girl was gone. But in reality, all the news outlets later have reported that she didn't actually start looking for her daughter until closer to 8 p.m. Right. So we have a bit of a time discrepancy there. And it could just be, you know, a mother's panicking, she's nervous. She gets her times wrong, or as we will see, there are reasons later to call into question Jennifer's behaviors and her words. Yeah, or she doesn't want to look like a horrible individual, so she's going to tell everybody that she's been searching all day when really she didn't pay much attention to her daughter. That's a very good possibility. And often I find when my mind is racing, my times are a little off because Things seem to be happening rather quickly when you're in that panic state. Right. So Jennifer calls her mother, Sherry, whom she and Nevea are living with. Sherry was at work. She's finishing up her shift at a food town grocery store in Monroe. With this news, Sherry puts down what she's doing. She leaves work and raced home to help look for Nevea. Well, let's give a little bit of background on Nevea. There is a Justice for Nevea website, so we gathered a lot of the following information from that website. And the site says that Nevea Buchanan was a typical five-year-old girl. She loved stuffed animals, and like most little girls, she named them all. Her favorite was a stuffed beagle that she named Harley. Now, she named him Harley because in addition to stuffed animals, Nevea loved motorcycles. She was born February 3rd, 2004. People that knew Nevaeh described her as shy, adorable, a little girl who liked to wear her hair in a ponytail. 
Neighbors described her as timid with a soft voice, real fragile. And then someone said Nevea had a smile that could melt a glacier. Her mother, Jennifer, told the media that her daughter loved motorcycles and trucks. She was a tomboy and was obsessed with the movie Jungle Book. Well, who isn't? Now, a more complete history of Nevea is that she had just graduated from preschool and was heading off to kindergarten in the fall. She lived in the Charlotte Arms apartment complex with her maternal grandmother, Sherry. Now, one detail here, Captain, is that Sherry actually had legal guardianship of Nevaeh, had legal guardianship of her for some time. This was because Jennifer, Nevaeh's mom, at one time was a drug addict and was sent to prison. When this went down, Sherry had taken her granddaughter in and Nevaeh had lived with Sherry in that apartment under Sherry's care for several years. Jennifer serves her time in prison, and then when she's released in early 2009, she moved in with her mom and her daughter. So this has been her home for quite some time. Yes, it has been. And one thing that is kind of clear here is that as far as being taken care of and being raised, it looked like Nevaeh considered Sherry more of her mother because that's what she knew for most of her life. Well, and Nevaeh goes missing in May 2009. And so her her mom gets out of prison early 2009. So she's really not back in her child's life for that long until she goes missing. I think that might be kind of key here as well. Now, we also, we also should note that Jennifer, Nevaeh's mom, was only 24 years of age when her five-year-old daughter, Nevaeh, went missing. The father, Shane Honenjosa, was only 22 at the time when Nevaeh went missing. So he was 17-ish when Nevaeh was conceived. He wasn't really in her life. Um, According to Medium, Dot com Shane, the father, had not spoken to his daughter, Nevaeh, in three years. But when she went missing, he traveled to Monroe. He lived in Ohio. So Monroe is very close to Monroe, Michigan, is very close to the Ohio border. And Shane, from my understanding, lives in Toledo, Ohio, which is the northern part of our state. He travels to Monroe to help look for his daughter, even though he's not spoken to her in quite some time. This, I, I think we need to commend him a little bit. We, we don't want to applaud him for not being a part of her life, but at the same time, he actually risked being arrested going to Monroe. He had recently not been able to pay his child support since losing his job. So he goes in there with the intention of, of helping. Now, what we can see here, Captain, very quickly in this case, and we're going to fan out quite a bit ourselves in our search looking for actual suspects, but we need to paint this the picture for what it is. This, other than Sherry, the grandmother, this is not a great situation for young Nevaeh. No. Her father's absent. He's He's a boy pretty much when she's born. Mother's absent because she's got drug addiction problems and then commits crimes. I mean, she's, she was in prison for actual crimes, not drug related crimes from my understanding. So not a great situation as far as mom and dad goes, Sherry, the grandmother's stepping up, stepping in and trying to help and trying to raise this, this beautiful little girl. Well, it's so sad because it's like the odds are stacked against her and that's sad. So where we stand now, Captain, we have a little girl missing from her apartment complex in Monroe, Michigan. Let's look at the earliest stages of this investigation first. Someone, and this is a little weird, but it's never been reported exactly who. This could have been Jennifer, her mom, could have been Grandma Sherry, could have been the apartment manager, could be somebody else entirely. Somebody called 911 at 8.15 p.m. And police issued the Amber Alert for five-year-old Nevaeh that same night. Now, Nevaeh was gone. Monroe County Sheriff Tillman Crutchfield announced that they were looking for two witnesses. This is very early on in their investigation. 
announces to the public, we're looking for two witnesses. And he states that these are elementary age boys who were seen playing on the playground at the Hollywood elementary school that backed up to the Charlotte arms apartment complex. And he said that this would have been around the last time that Nevaeh was seen. They were also seeking a green boxy minivan that was seen parked at the playground between 6 and 7 p.m. on the evening that Nevaeh disappeared. He said that they thought that the van driver might be a witness, but of course an unknown van in the area where a child went missing was cause for raised eyebrows. Ban the green minivan. Well, like you said, this case is going to be tough because we know that she's outside playing, but we don't know how long she was gone once she was reported gone. Again, for those not familiar, Monroe, Michigan, it's a small town, about 20,000 people, somewhat near the Ohio line. The River Raisin runs through the middle of town. The apartment complex itself, the Charlotte Arms, is located between North Malcolm Street and Riverview Avenue next to that Hollywood Elementary School. Reportedly, this apartment complex has 180 units. So this is a rather large apartment complex, in my opinion. And it's made up of a number of buildings. These buildings, Captain, are only three stories high. I've seen it reported that the residents were on the lower end of the socioeconomic spectrum. As with most neighborhoods, some of these residents have a somewhat checkered past. Now, Nevaeh, Sherry, and Jennifer's unit was on the ground level. This is important to me when we're looking at this case. So for anyone, or in this case, Nevaeh, to get from the apartment where we know she was safe, well, and fine to the parking lot area where it's suspected that she was would have been last seen or went missing from, this based off of the scooter where the scooter's later located, All the little girl had to do was walk out the front door, which is what Jennifer seemingly allowed her to do. The other thing, too, we got to note, this is a five-year-old girl. Yes, she's probably used to playing outside with other kids, but we get the Jennifer's friend's daughter, who seems to be keeping an eye on Nevaeh, but not Jennifer herself. It would be a tough situation because essentially your daughter's being raised by your mother. You then come into the picture. There is some kind of routine. There's some kind of familiarity already happening with discipline and who's telling you what to do and, and all that stuff that you almost have to take a back seat as a, as a parent. And these cases are incredibly difficult to report. And it's not just because we're talking about a little girl that's missing. But it's also because when you have a situation like this, it's easy to blame the parent or the parents. And you also have to keep in mind that they, if they're innocent, if they did nothing wrong here, you know, maybe they could have been a little more strict or kept in better, a better eye on Nevaeh or obviously put her in a better situation in her young life as far as being a father or a mother goes. But if neither of them did anything wrong, well, then they're very much victims too. So these are difficult to, to try to walk that fine line of telling not just what we think and what we see, but also trying to stay, keep an open heart to, to these victims. It's absolutely irresponsible and unimaginable to spend years not talking with your daughter, not being involved in your daughter's life. It's ridiculous. Now we will fast forward to June 4th, 2009. By this time, Nevaeh has been missing for almost two weeks. Now, in many of these true crime stories, we hear about fishermen finding bodies in the water unaware that a person is actually missing. They catch a glimpse of something unusual, maybe bobbing in the river or stream as they cast in their line. But fishermen don't usually find bodies by stepping on them like we have here in this week's case. But here in the garage, Captain, there's a first time for everything. 
right? So now we introduce Guy Bickley, his 15-year-old son, Ryan, and Guy's father, Lowell. So we have three generations of the Bickley family setting out to spend some time fishing on the River Raisin near Dixon Road in Raisinville Township. This part of the river is roughly about 30 or so feet across. This particular spot is about 10 miles away from the Charlotte Arms apartment complex. They, the Bickleys, had never fished this part of the river before. They said that they parked off of Dixon Road inside the guardrail on the edge of a steep slope that led down to the river. The trio followed an overgrown path down through brushy terrain leading to a good spot along the riverbank. At this spot, there were some rocks, which is typically ideal for fishermen in this situation because you can stand or perch up on these rocks while casting. Another group of rocks was easily accessible by walking across a small patch of concrete that looked as though it may have tumbled there from the roadway above. So Guy Bickley is standing on that concrete patch. And he says a chunk of it broke off. He noted that the concrete was thinly spread. So when what we would later find out would be an eight inch by six inch chunk of this concrete breaks off, he says right away he smelled and saw that something was not right. He said flies were buzzing around in the area Guy chipped off a little more of the concrete to see what was going on. Then he stops because he does see something. Under the concrete was what looked like human skin and hair. And he said it smelled like death. So they called the authorities. Excavation of that concrete revealed a shallow grave containing an intact corpse of a child. Everyone knew who it was, that kind of situation, even before Nevea was formally ID'd. The shirt on the little body fit the description of the one Nevea was last seen wearing. It was not immediately apparent what the cause of death was. Very sad scene. Per ABC News, Monroe County Sheriff Tillman Crutchfield said shortly after the discovery of Nevea's body, that there were no visible signs of abuse and that she had been buried along the River Raisin for, quote, a while. He declined to comment specifically about how the body was buried, only that it had some type of concrete or cement on top. He also would not say what else investigators recovered from the grave. Obviously, somebody that's trying to conceal her, her body. Yes, very much so, and went to some great lengths to do so. Now, you know, the, the sheriff himself is probably in a bit of a state of shock as well. They've spent almost two weeks now looking for this little girl. This is how she's found. Nobody wanted to find her this way. He does throw in the comment when he's being asked about what they found. He says, authorities are looking for a disturbed individual, which I, I feel like that's kind of a throw your hands in the air kind of sit not in a good way, you know, throw your hands in the air. Like, I don't know. I I'm kind of at a loss here for words. I don't know exactly who we are looking for at this point to go back to the day she went missing. Like you said, there's over 180 units. So that's a lot of individuals in this town looking for this little girl and talking and spreading the word that this little girl is missing. So this is going to be big news when they end up finding her in the concrete. Yeah. And from my experience following these cases and from what we've covered here in the garage, captain, we know that these stranger child abductions are rather rare. Now I'm not saying that that's an impossibility here. It certainly could be the situation, but oftentimes it's somebody somewhat close to the child that is responsible, either somebody that is known to the family or in this case, and what I think you're circling around here is that the possibility is that the threat or, or, or whoever is responsible could be somebody that 
that lived in that apartment complex or had reason to be there for any number of reasons. And also, like you said, there's a this playground that's abutting the property that's beside the apartment po- property. Creeps are going to find out about that pretty quickly. Yeah, that's that's the thing for me that I kept I I can't shake off is this idea that if you were somewhat local, stranger to the family, stranger to people from that apartment complex, we've always said this with when it comes to especially serial offenders, right? Serial offenders typically have a victim type and they know where to go looking for their victim that they prefer. It's almost like you and I going to the grocery store. We, I don't go out and hunt my own meat because there's a store right down the street where it will, it will have plenty of it there. And well, it's convenient. I do. <laughs> I hunt my own meat all the time. But here, here's the thing, though, too, is what do we know so far? This girl is taken from an apartment complex. She is now found. The same town, right? About 10 miles away from the apartment complex. But before we move on to something else, what, what I wanted to point out was if if a predator was looking for this type of victim, a younger child, boy or mm-hmm. girl, unfortunately, this is an ideal place to find said victim. Because as you pointed out, the playground, the elementary school, the apartment complex where there's kids outside buzzing and zipping around and playing all day long, and there's a pool there as well. I mean, that's that's some of the key locations for these types of creeps to find this type of victim. And this is all smashed together all in one locale. Right. And what the point I was trying to get at before rudely being cut off. No, uh, is this to me seems like a location that you'd have to know by being a local and being where her body was found. Yes. No, no. I'm talking about the apartment complex. Look, if you, if you're not a local, you're just going to drive to the next part of town and go, oh, let's, here's this playground that's connected to this uh, apartment complex, which is connected to a pool, which is connected to this elementary school. Like you said, this is probably somebody that lives in the area or knows the area, is familiar with the area. And then she's found 10 miles away. So to me, this evidence is saying that this person is local, you know, and when we mean, when we say local, you know, 20, 30 mile radius from the abduction point or the the point where um, her body was found. Now I want to hit on some things before we move on to our next items here in this investigation. And this is in regards to the body being found. So we, we should note here that the police have never said what state of undress or dress that Nevea was in, but there was a now deleted Fox Detroit news piece that said she was in the hole without clothing and her clothing and a Bush beer can were thrown in the hole with her. Uh, FBI have traced the beer can to a highlight market in Monroe. So they were able to trace where this beer can came from, or at least where it was purchased from. The thing here is what's not clear is this beer can being found, it's actually not clear whether it was found in the hole or just nearby. That makes sense. But one thing that kind of confirms the clothing being tossed in on top of the girl was that one of the guys, Guy Bickley, who found her, confirmed that he could see her bare back when the concrete broke apart. So that gives a little more... Some of that speculation, some of that's rumor. Again, a lot of those details coming from what is a now deleted article, news article about uh, this case. But if those, if that information is in fact true, it gives a little more insight to the scene. But just to be clear, this this is um, a hole that was covered by concrete. 
to describe it as plain and simple as I can, it appears that somebody dug a somewhat shallow grave, placed items in there, and then created this concrete slab there, likely there, or brought it with them, right, and placed it over top. Whoever did this was really hoping that she would never be found. back cheers mates cheers captain to the windows to the walls cheers to everybody in the front and the back let's get back into it so police searched the river area near where the body was found they spent two days there pouring over the area looking for any footprints any possible debris that they could find in the area and see if it's connected to their case they did take dna from the three bickley boys so they could eliminate anything with their dna on it they issued a press release asking all who may have fished in that area to call the police, call the sheriff's department if they had seen anything at all during their time spent there. Because keep in mind, at this point, as far as what the public knows is this girl goes missing and then just a little under two weeks later, her body is found in this location 10 miles away. We don't know, us the public, We don't know when she was placed there. Was it the same day she was abducted? Was it a day before she was found? I mean, there's a, there's a considerable gap of time there. My guess is that she was kidnapped and taken somewhere else, but this location's weird to me because it would be somewhat remote because it's for fishermen, but it would seem like maybe that this spot would be known by fishermen. Almost like the person would want to put her, oh, well, this is a secluded area, but I'm going to cover up her so well that like this dark secret is going to be right underneath everybody's feet while they're fishing. Yeah, I can't speak as to how popular this fishing spot was because we have kind of conflicting thoughts when you want to create an educated guess on that. One, we have the Bickleys who say they fished often and had never fished that spot before. But at the same time, we have Guy Bickley who says that he was told of the spot from other fishermen. So it, it is somewhat known, this particular spot anyway. Even though investigators wouldn't address it, they clearly did find something else at the grave. Maybe it was the clothing. Maybe it was the beer can, as we mentioned earlier. But we do know that they did find something else at this site where her body was recovered from. Because in mid-June, articles said that investigators were awaiting results of forensic testing on items recovered with Nevaeh's body at the riverfront. Sheriff Crutchfield told the Detroit Free Press, quote, We have specific information that is known to the perpetrator, and we are going to hold that near and dear to us, end quote. The police have never discussed what else was found in the area and never really gave details about the concrete that was found on top of Nevea. We should note here that this particular area was a fishing spot known to some locals, like we just said, but the Detroit Free Press reported that on the day after the body was found, investigators were contacting area home improvement and hardware stores This is because they were trying to track down purchases of quick setting concrete mixes, reportedly specifically 90 pound bags. So this is from Medium and it says only a few stores in the area sold such large bags, one of them being Coleman Cement Company. Now this could be, this is likely unrelated, but it's interesting to note that the fence outside of the Coleman cement company had recently been cut. Now there's no report of if anything was stolen and if it, if things were stolen, what 
they would have been. Did they find something at the scene that indicated to them that they are looking for a 90 pound bag search because, uh, uh, sorry, a 90 pound bag purchase, because that's what they were specifically asking for when they were calling all these different places. And medium is saying that Coleman cement company was one of the few places that sold bags that size. And it was also reported that it, that sometime around this time frame that a fence outside of the company had been cut outside of their building had been cut. Right. So I'm saying that it, we have that report that there's damage to the fence, which would indicate to me or most people that someone was trying to steal something. However, that report does not tell us that one, that anything was stolen and two, if anything was stolen, what it was. Yeah. And they probably did some kind of measurement of the concrete and, and maybe that's how they got to the 90 pounds. Possibly. I mean, you could buy two bags of a smaller size. Yeah, no, very good point. And maybe like you said, there's a, a flap from the, from the concrete because you know, these bags, when you go to make the concrete, you just rip them open and, and toss them to the side. So heck maybe there, there was the bag there. Well, and that's what I'm saying. I, you know, they spent two days at that crime scene looking over all of the debris in the area. Maybe they came across a 90 pound bag of concrete mix. And I say that because Guy Bickley, who found the grave, just so happened to be familiar with concrete and the general workings of concrete. He tells the news that in his opinion, whoever buried Nevea probably used river water to mix the concrete. He said it looked to him as though someone had dug a hole, put the girl in, poured a bag of concrete mix on top, and poured water over the whole thing. So not actually mixing it up in a proper way, kind of hastily doing it there on the scene. So not a professional job, not really the proper method for for making the concrete. Right. But maybe that's be, you know good because the concrete cracked and we were able to see that she was buried. If, if they would have done a better job, maybe that concrete never cracks and we, we never find her. There was a reward for finding Nevea at the time of discovering her body. So after the body was positively identified using DNA, the Bickley's split $20,000. This was reward money that was being offered by the FBI. Now reportedly guy Bickley, the Bickley's were a little, they accepted the money begrudgingly, right? They Guy Bickley says on record, if the reward money came from the community, he would have declined it. But since it was funds from the federal government, he accepted it. And he told the news, screw the money. It has released a lot of emotions that I don't like. What he meant was he hated being the one finding Nevaeh's body. He said he would have preferred that someone else had found her. He yeah. found himself breaking down at the memory of seeing her little body in the concrete grave and said that the emotional impact was wreaking havoc on his daily life. Well, that's something he's never going to forget. And how could you? I mean, that'd be devastating for anybody. I feel compelled to give a warning here. I know that a lot of shows give you a warning at the top of the show saying that some of the information discussed here might be graphic in nature or disturbing to hear. We here at the garage don't feel the need to, to always give those warnings at the top of the show because it's a true crime show. It's dark material. You should expect to hear something that's uncomfortable, maybe even something that you don't want to hear. But you know, I've, I've become a little thick skinned when it comes to a lot of this stuff. And this part still bothered me a little bit. So I feel compelled to give a little bit of a warning here because we are going to go very briefly through the autopsy, not, not the entire thing. An autopsy on the remains was performed by Dr. Carl Schmidt of the Wayne County Medical Examiner's Office. The next part that I'm going to read is directly from the autopsy report. It says, quote, this child was found in a shallow grave. Part of the body was interred was found face down and the back was covered by a layer of cement-like material. 
The body showed moderate signs of decomposition. Dr. Schmidt's opinion was that the death was caused by aspiration of fine particulate material. Here he means dirt. Her death was caused by her not being able to breathe and she couldn't breathe because of dirt. The particulate material was found in the upper airway, the trachea, and the medium of the small caliber airways. This means that the child's face was forcibly maintained or embedded into a dirt surface. Now, whether this resulted from another person forcibly pressing the child's face into dirt or whether she was buried alive cannot be determined by this autopsy. But the manner of death, of course, was ruled a homicide. Well, and this is difficult, too, because you don't know if the killer put her in there knowing that she was dead or not. You know what I mean? Like Exactly. He could, he could have put her in there assuming at that point she was dead. And then, obviously, we now know um, the cause of death. Yes, and again, there was a certain level of decomposition that had already taken place. This, to me, indicates that she was likely there for a considerable amount of time, likely shortly after the abduction or closer to the time of and date of the abduction. And you're exactly right, Captain. We've seen plenty of cases where someone attempts to smother or strangle a victim and they come to, and maybe this monster thought that she was already dead before placing her in, in the ground and then leaving her there. But the, again, it's, it's the autopsy gives us some insights, but not a whole lot as far as figuring some things out. Right. Because we don't know the facts of it is that she was still breathing when she was either buried alive under this concrete or suffocated by someone holding her face into the dirt. Those are pretty much the two options that we're left with. But there was no visible trauma to her body, such as blows to the head or sharp force injuries. Seems like we have no puncture wounds. We don't have any bruising around the neck or even around our arms that the autopsy tells us about. Nothing that came up in the autopsy. It doesn't mean that it didn't happen. It just means that the state that her body was found in those things could not be determined. But yes, there's no, what is clear in the autopsy is there's no visible signs of trauma to her body, such as blows to the head or sharp force injury. So that clears up that, in my opinion. Now, Sheriff Crutchfield is on record saying that the body had evidently been there for quite some time. Those were his words, this leading many to conclude that Nevaeh was killed shortly after she was last seen. Yeah, it's a tough one because if, if I'm playing detective here, again, 10-mile gap between where she is abducted and where she is found. And so I'm thinking local, both spots. I think you could argue that you need to be local to know them well or feel safe around because again, if you're not from that area and you go to that apartment complex with the, the play area and the pool and everything, you you might not feel as brazen to, to try to take a victim. If you know the area better, if you've studied the area better, you're going to feel more inclined and feel safer as the killer to, to try to take a victim. But then we have this half ass shallow grave with some concrete that we don't even think that the individual took the time to mix. So that, so, so that means on, on some level, this guy is half hazard. I, I, I think that could play into the, the, you know, the, the psyche of this individual. Well, I'm going to take the time to bury her to make this grave, but I'm not going to do a good job doing it, if that makes any sense. So when I look at this spot where the body's recovered from, it's remote. You're getting there by one of two methods, boat or vehicle. 
And I purposely described how the Bickleys had to park and where they chose to park their vehicle to go fishing in the spot to demonstrate what it would take somebody to get from the road to this spot where Nevea is found. And what I see here, what, what I tend to believe is that the perpetrator is haphazardly putting together this air quotes grave to conceal the body, but does not feel comfortable and does not have a lot of time to do this. If a body's going to be discovered there, you really don't want your car, your vehicle, your truck, your license plate being spotted parked on the side of this country road. Right. You know, the, the Bickley said that they parked on the other side of the guardrail. I live near water. I live near an area that, that a lot of people fish and a lot of people park like that. They park off of the side of the road, uh, off of the guard, you know, behind the guardrails. So some drunk doesn't come along and accidentally crash into their car. And it, it has nothing to do with true crime. It has nothing to do with the, our job here in the garage. But for whatever reason, I take mental note when I'm driving and see somebody parked, especially at night, even though they're all fishermen, you know what I mean? Like it, this is an area where people fish, but it's, it's easy to spot a vehicle when it's parked there by itself. When you don't see anything in the immediate area, it's easy to go, Oh, I saw a green Bronco there or a red S 10 pickup truck. Right. Well, and it sticks out because it sticks out. Yeah. And if, the other method would be for somebody to use a boat or some kind of watercraft to get there. I don't know a lot about this, this water way here. Um, so I, I, I can't really speculate on that angle too much, but I see somebody that's hastily putting together and trying to conceal the body that to me would indicate, or I would lean toward the opinion of they probably drove to this location. Now, it's also important to note here, Captain, that the autopsy report did not even address the following items. So we don't know one way or the other what the conclusion was, but it did not address whether the victim was sexually assaulted. Now, per Fox News, Jennifer Buchanan, the mother, said that police told her that Nevaeh was not sexually assaulted and that no drugs were found in her system. Again, on record, police would not discuss whether the child was sexually abused but there was a detective on record stating that the toxicology reports came back negative. Here, I want to point out something and be perfectly clear. Jennifer Buchanan says that police told her that she was not, the victim was not sexually assaulted. I don't have a strong uh, belief that they would tell her. I agree. Factual information about the case, especially given the, the living situation and given Jennifer, her situation, her past, her police record. I don't know that they're going to be giving mom all of the facts here in this case. And when we get, when we get eyeballs deep into this investigation, you will see why it's, it's normal. It's perfectly normal for these types of investigations to have hold back information. And what the public doesn't always understand is that hold back information is not just hold back information from the general public. It's oftentimes hold back information from the persons closest to the victim and closest to the investigation itself, meaning mom likely does not know much more about this investigation than the public does. Once we get eyeballs deep in this, we will see and you will understand very quickly why police would be hesitant to discuss particular details about this case, evidentiary details about this case with Jennifer. For a second here, let's pretend that there was no sexual assault, right? Right. That makes me go, well, what the hell's going on here? Why would someone kidnap and murder a child if not to sexually assault them? Typically, unfortunately, that is the motive in a lot of these cases. So to offer up an educated guess here, we have a couple of options, in my opinion, Captain. One. Nevaeh could have been 
a source of some type of sexual pleasure for the abductor without any actual contact taking place. Two, perhaps her abductor had every intention of sexually assaulting the victim, but something happened. She fought back. He panicked and killed her before going through with it. Three, maybe the abduction and the murder was the goal the entire time and was the only goal. Perhaps to, I don't know, silence her over previous abuse, send a message to someone, get back at someone, or even potentially set someone up. And again, to be clear, that the body being found in a state of undress is from one source. That source has deleted the article. We do not know why they deleted the article. So something could be wrong, could be factually incorrect. It was right. in that article, and the the factually incorrect item could be that she was, in fact, clothed when she was found. But there seems to be a lot indicating that, that she was in some form of undress when she was discovered. Now, the community really pulled together here. They went all out. They donated for Nevaeh's funeral services. The funeral was attended by a 1,000 people. There were funeral homes that offered to donate their services to the family. So kudos to the community for, for pulling together to help this, this young girl and to help out uh, her family in this worst of situations. Now, everyone described Monroe as a quiet little town, a tranquil community where things like this don't happen. That's what we hear so often when things like this do happen is this is an area where these things don't happen. But her horrific murder was absolutely devastating and terrifying to the residents. Nevaeh's headstone, which she was buried in St. Joseph Cemetery in Monroe, Michigan, it reads, Monroe's Little Angel. The entrance to the steep, rocky path leading to the riverbank where her body was found was marked by a cross and rock sculptures and mementos of things like stuffed animals were placed there by people in the community. Now, before Nevaeh was found, of course, police were focusing in on finding her, and the investigation centered on interviewing residents of the apartment complex, following leads generated from eyewitness statements and interviewing those residents and also tracking down registered sex offenders and so on. But of course, after she was found, the investigation went down a little bit of a different avenue. They started following up on the 1,200 tips that they had received. Remember, they were very quickly and actively asking the public for help right from Jump Street on this case. And it appears that the public responded in the form of, over 1,200 tips that were received by law enforcement. Well, and that's a lot of tips, but what a devastating situation for the the parents in that community. You'd be afraid that this could happen to your child, and if you're a child in this community, you're afraid that this could happen to you next. But as said in the early stages of the investigation, they focused on sketchy people in the apartment complex. And, of course, they visited the apartment where Nevaeh's little friend Austin Baker lived with his parents. She had played there with Austin earlier that day. This fills out the timeline a little bit more. So at some point, she's at Austin's house or apartment earlier that day. And then Jennifer comes to the apartment to collect Nevaeh. And the two of them walk to Kmart. Now, Austin is also the same boy whose apartment Jennifer said that she assumed Nevaeh was heading to when she left the apartment later around 6.30 and then vanished. Police took carpet samples. This was a little confusing to me here, Captain. When they visited Austin's place and interviewed his parents and interviewed him, they took carpet samples from the apartment. I guess they're trying to match fibers. Uh, it's been reported that possibly fibers were found under Nevaeh's fingernails. But what's been reported is that all, most, if not all of the apartment units were believed to have the same carpeting. So it's not really clear to me how matching the fibers 
from Austin's apartment or really any other apartment at Charlotte Arms would help them focus in on a specific suspect. And keep in mind, Nevaeh lived in an apartment complex in another unit. So right. the carpeting in her own apartment could be identical to those in the other apartments. Unless it's one of those situations that I actually used to work for a company that would, when the people would move out, we'd go in and we'd change the carpet and would paint. And so is it possible that they changed the carpet? And so they know that some of the buildings have older carpet, some of the buildings have newer carpet. And that would give us some kind of, look, if we have 180 units, that maybe that uh, divides that in half, right? And so now now I'm looking at 90-some people that could be involved and not 180. One thing that we weren't able to find was the surveillance situation. If there were any type of security cameras at this apartment complex, it's hard to believe that in 2009 that there would be none at all. But if there had been, in this case, to me, it seems very likely that at least there were no cameras on the back of the building where her scooter was later found. Because if we had that information, if we had surveillance from that area, I feel like we're not sitting here over a decade later with an unsolved case. Now, I mentioned earlier that we are going to call into question a lot of Jennifer's behaviors. And to me, it's not so much about the time frame in which her daughter goes missing. It's more about her actions leading up to her daughter's disappearance. So even before Nevaeh's body was found, police already had suspects. And these were publicly named suspects before the body was even found. In fact, this was within 24 hours of the little girl missing. Police were already honing in on a couple of potential suspects. It was two guys. And these two guys were both exes, ex-boyfriends of Jennifer's. And they were both immediately picked up on probation violations as soon as investigators got their names from Jennifer. So what probation violations where they picked up on they're picked up because they were both registered sex offenders who had victimized children in the past el creepos so a- after it came out that they were each hanging out with jennifer each of these and, and kudos to the police for doing this they get these guys names and they're like you know what It's a probation violation for each one of these guys to be associated with the child, a parole violation. Mm -hmm. So let's go find these guys, pick them up, arrest them, and throw their asses in some jail cells. And we can interview them, talk to them, see if we can get them to talk. Because we're interested in what these guys have to say and what they may know. Because of, for so many obvious reasons. It's a very cold cold world we live in i mean go take a look at her and to imagine that somebody would want to harm her just makes no sense so technically captain both of these guys are arrested for quote simply being associated with a child this per abc news their parole conditions required that they have no association with children and that they not even have romantic relationships with women who have children. The sheriff publicly named both of them as persons of interest and threw them in cells while the investigators did their thing. right thank you so much for joining us here in the garage make sure you sign up on our mailing list at truecrimegarage.com so you are in the know and you can get all the promo codes i got a i got a promo code coming at you next week if you're on the mailing list so sign up at truecrimegarage.com until tomorrow join us back here in the garage be good be kind and don't litter